someone switched off two of the buttons over there. It's interesting because we have some diminutive people in the church. They weren't here this last week, so they could not have done it. I think of uh, Caleb. He likes to press buttons. And uh, I always have to turn off the, the uh, player part on the piano over here. It's normally on. Mrs. Pratt well, probably didn't get turned on this week, did it? Normally it gets turned on and then the soundboard gets adapted with But he was not here. Caleb wasn't here. Susanna wasn't here. So, uh, had to be someone else. <laughs> uh, please open your Bibles tonight to uh, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. And uh, we've, we're looking at transcendent truths and really kind of finishing or uh, continuing with last week's message. Last week we looked at the doctrine of eminence, the eminent return of our Savior Jesus Christ, the doctrine of eminence. And it is a Bible doctrine that is really plainly laid out in the Scriptures and simply understood, but one which uh, is falsely taught or there or there are things it's, it's, it's heavily undermined in recent days and uh, I think it's important as believers that we understand the importance of the doctrine or the teaching of the imminent return of Jesus Christ I can find second Peter in my Bible but I can't find first Peter okay so first Peter chapter 1 and uh, we'll start there this evening Let's go ahead and uh, read verses 20 through uh, 25. And uh, speaking of Jesus Christ, a lamb without blemish and spot, verse 20, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing you've purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which, which by the gospel is preached unto you. Let's, let's ask God to help us with our understanding this evening. Father, please do help us with our comprehension tonight as we search the scriptures and we look at important truths we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we looked at the eminence, the doctrine of the imminent return of Jesus. And this week we're going to specific, or, and, or well, let's, just, let's cover just a little bit of ground in what we looked at with that, we did distinguish in the Bible the difference between the second coming and Jesus calling up the saints. Those are two separate events in the Bible described different ways. And, you know, it doesn't take much more than careful notice to recognize the difference between when Jesus calls up the saints, the reality that he doesn't touch the ground and that that is not a judgment that Jesus comes for. That's the distinct difference. In other words, when the Lord Jesus catches or calls us up in the air, we're not returning with Him to rule and reign at that time. That's not when Jesus comes to rule and to reign. And that is such a simple fact that is so easily overlooked by individuals who, for whatever reason, want to believe that the tribulation judgments are for believers. And... uh, I've spent a little bit of time listening uh, to some of the attacks on the imminent return of Jesus Christ and to some of the individuals who propagate that. And one of the arguments that they like to make is that saints go through tribulation, but the mistake they make, which is a grand one, is that they equate persecution, that is, from the Satan and from man with judgment at the hand of God. And my friend, those are pretty different, aren't they? Actually. You know, if if unbelievers persecute us, 
The Bible does call that, in some instances, tribulations and persecutions. In other words, the word tribulation is a word that simply means hardship. So what they like to do is to take the word tribulation and create a doctrine or equate everything that the word is used in the into one context and say, well, if the tribulation is any time the word tribulation is used, <coughs> then they just take the word tribulation and make a one-word doctrine. Well, every word has meaning with it in its context, and there are different types of tribulation. Do you understand what I'm saying there? In other words, there's a big difference between being persecuted by an evil government or being persecuted by people who hate God, who do evil things to you because you're a Christian, being persecuted by an evil religion, uh, being persecuted by uh, men or man-made circumstances versus God judging. And when you study the Revelation, the Apocalypse, that is the things that are revealed about future events, when Jesus comes to earth, and when even before Jesus Christ touches down on earth, when the events of the seven years of tribulation begin to happen, God is the one who is causing the judgments. And the scale, by comparison, is so different, it's almost opposite. In other words, what happens when a believer is persecuted, what is the outcome of a believer's being persecuted? It's usually good. Oftentimes people are saved. God, God takes evil and makes it good. Good. You guys got it right on the first guess, okay? When a believer is persecuted by the wicked or by the Satan, God's able to make a Job situation out of it. He's able to take evil and He's able to make it good. What happens when God is causing the tribulation? Is the Satan going to make it good? Do you see? You see my point there. I mean, the the notion that persecution is all alike is not only fallacious; it's grand ignorance. There's a big difference between God doing something and man doing something, isn't there? I mean, God destroying a third part of the earth. My friend, God doesn't want there to be some working together for good in that. God destroying the rebels, the wicked ones, who have rebelled against Him. God doesn't want there to be an end for the good of those individuals. That's judgment. And when God's judgment finally comes, my friend, there's not going to be any escaping it. There's not going to be any grace coupled along with it. The Bible says about us that the trying of our faith worketh patience. God's not trying anybody's faith. The Bible says, let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. You see the doctrinal error of that? In other words, if tribulation is caused by God, and we're not supposed to say God's causing it, then it must be something different, isn't it? It must be a tribulation or of a different kind. And there's a big difference, like I said, between evil that God can work for good and between God judging. It's a grand difference. Uh, matter of fact, I, I want to say this as cautiously as I can, but I somewhat thumb my nose at what man can do. In other words, I, I agree with the apostles when Peter and John said, we ought to obey God rather than men. They beat them, they let them go, and the apostle, they said, don't preach anymore in the name of Jesus. And they said, we ought to obey God rather than men. I'm really not concerned terribly with what evil people can do to me. They can kill me, but Jesus said, I'm not supposed to fear them which are able to harm my body. But I'm supposed to fear the one which is able to destroy both my soul and my body in hell. And so, don't care what you do to me in that sense. You understand that? In other words, regardless of what evil man intends, God is able to work it for good and He's able to give me the grace which is sufficient for me in it. Unless, until you've gone through something that you could never go through. You haven't experienced grace yet. But grace literally is God's ability 
to enable you to have the strength that isn't yours to go through something you couldn't go through. I don't know how many times I've watched people in their lives go through something and my thought was, I could never do that. I could never go through that. And you know, the converse is also true. I've had people say to me, you know, I could never go through that. I couldn't deal with that. I couldn't do that. Why is that? Well, because of grace. I couldn't either. But God gives me grace. And He gives to every man the measure according to grace that we need. So, the doctrine of eminence is an important doctrine. And last week we finalized or we finished talking about that with the conclusion that the doctrine of eminence is an important doctrine that helps us to understand how vital it is that we look for the coming of Jesus so that we would be found so doing when He comes. Of course, why is... Let me ask that question. You tell me, you phrase it to me. Why is the imminent return of Jesus Christ important to understand? Why is, it, why is it an important doctrine? Why would it be a transcendent truth? Well, I don't know. I don't see why it matters. <laughs> What's that? I'd say it's very foundational. Foundational? Okay, it is to what? What do you mean? Just to how we, know, how we should act and believe. Okay, to how we act. What behavior is affected by the knowledge that Jesus could return at any moment? Okay. We need to be one to be seeing souls saved. We know that there's a limited amount of time. Okay? Let me illustrate it this way. My brother and I used to like to play Monopoly when we were kids. And we haven't played Monopoly in a while, my brother and I. We should probably have a knockdown drag out Monopoly game sometime. What's that? I kill you both. Well, we should let you come play our house rules. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we used to play Monopoly when we were kids. And it would get ridiculous. My brother and I are a year and a half apart. And a lot of times, growing up, we shared a bedroom in the basement. And we had some very, very sneaky... You know, you sometimes you think parents just know everything. You ever, anyone here ever just like, how do they know that? Like, you had the kind of parents... That, well, my mom was that way. And she had her ways of catching us when we were doing things. We were supposed to go to bed at night, but ever so, ever so often, uh, we'd get in the middle of a Monopoly game. And so we'd go to bed, but then, you know, we would take our blankets off of our beds and we would cover the windows that would shine out onto the front yard where Mom could look out the window and see. We had steps that creaked going downstairs so we could hear if the steps were going on. So we would, we'd have an all-nighter Monopoly game. We literally would play games, you know, where you, you know, you, you give loans to the person that you're beating just so that he could go around and go one more time and get 200 bucks so you can get richer. Just kind of keep them alive and kill them off slowly. You know, but <laughs> we would have these all night games. And I remember this one time. We played a game. We literally, I don't think we went to bed at night. If we did, it was like, I don't think we did go to bed at night. And I remember mom came down and uh, came down to our room. And of course, the Monopoly board was on the floor and other things too. Our room was not uh, up to par. And my mom said, I'm going to go like one or two things she said she was going to do. And she said, when I come back, this place had better be spick and span. Did anybody have parents that used the phrase or used the word spick and span? I don't know what that means. I know that they made a cleaner called spick and span. But she'd say that, this place better be spick and span. What that means is it better be spotless. And so, yes, we were in the middle of a Monopoly game. And you don't just move a Monopoly board when it's got all the properties laid out and hotels and houses and those sort of things. You do so very, very carefully if you're going to. And not only that, but you don't just walk away from a good Monopoly game without finding out how it ends up. And so Mom left, and we thought, well, we've got just a little bit of time. We, don't, we, we guessed at where she was going. And we tried to figure out how long she'd be gone and how much time it would take to really clean our room if both of us gave it maximum effort at the same time. And we continued the Monopoly game. And it went longer than we thought it should go, as should have gone. It finally ended, and when we looked at the clock, we were just like, oh, no. Mom is going to be home any second. And you want to talk about people that could clean. Somehow, Daniel and I got our room. What we did first was we fake cleaned it. You know, 
you, where you take everything and you hide it somewhere. Uh, like, so you take all your clothes and you shove them under one corner under the bed, everything, push it, make it look clean, make the beds. And then, so we did the fake clean stage first. So we vacuumed and fake cleaned. We shoved everything under something or I don't remember how we did it. We hid everything. And then after we fake cleaned it, we thought, well, she probably won't kill us at this level. And then we started just really fast putting everything away. And somehow we got everything cleaned up. We literally got it all cleaned up. And Mom came home and actually said, wow, guys, this looks great. Good job. You worked really hard. Good, you know. And we thought, yeah, we played Monopoly almost the whole time you were gone. But we got it done in time. Okay. Imminence. That's what imminent is. Imminence is. It means going to happen in a sudden moment, going to happen at any time. Now, the importance of the doctrine of imminence, like Brother Taj was saying, is that it affects what you're doing because, man, if Jesus comes, time's going to be cut short. Let me ask you a question. Do you have enough? Do you have enough eternal rewards? You got enough? Well, God evidently doesn't think so because you're still living and breathing and walking on this earth. So God doesn't think you've had enough. Uh, have you ever felt like time's running out and you just haven't gotten enough done? <coughs> well, anytime I think about the doctrine of the imminent return of Jesus Christ, and I think Jesus is coming soon, there's a part of me that says, good, I'm glad he's coming. Man, if it's tonight, there are so many things. I won't, I won't have to drive to Arkansas tonight if Jesus comes. I can think of all the things I won't have to do if Jesus comes. But then there's the other side of me that says, oh no, I'm going to have to have what I've done in this life be it for eternity. And I haven't done enough for Jesus. And that's the value of the doctrine of eminence. You see it? It's an important doctrine. You take that away and you have believers that are like, well, you know, we know we'll have seven years from when this starts. And the fact of the matter is the Bible says we don't know when the day when the, that Jesus is going to come. Okay, so tonight I just want to look at uh, a phrase, and I want to look at the word last in the Bible. Uh, verse 20, I want to just help you understand. We talk about last days. We're not talking about a future event, we're talking about a present event. Verse 20 of 1 Peter Chapter 1, the Bible says, Who verily, speaking of Jesus, was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you. So before the world was ever made, Jesus Christ was God's plan to reconcile mankind. That was God's plan. Before, before creation ever happened, before man was ever made, before man ever sinned, God's plan was for Jesus Christ to come. And Peter said that Jesus was planned before the foundation of the world, but He was in these last days manifest unto us. In other words, you've just now seen Jesus, is what Peter is saying. And these are the last days, the last times. Okay, that's one use of the word last days or last times. Let's look at, it, at another one. Can you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Hey guys, you're just going to have to put the cell phone away. It's too distracting for me to watch you play your game. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll only be about 15 more minutes, and then it'll be just fine. Okay? So try to pay attention because there's some things you can learn that will actually help your life. Okay? Verse 10. Uh, I hope this is... Oh, yeah, verse 11. Verse 10. This is in the know ye not the known righteous shall inherit the kingdom of God, and then... Continued in verse 10, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, uh, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now notice verse 11. Uh, but ye, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. I think I've written this down. Oh, I'm in chapter 6. I'm supposed to be in chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm sorry I'm distracted this evening. Okay. Uh, now, all these things, these are examples of people who died with, without Jesus, the children of Israel. 
verse 11. Now all these things, verse 11 of chapter 10. Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Okay, do you see the phrase, the ends of the world are come? Who is that? Who is 1 Corinthians chapter 10 written to? Who? Okay, the Corinthian church and whom else? All believers. To the church, right? 1 Corinthians is written to the church. And in the example written to the church in this letter, which is for us, the Bible says, all of the things that are recorded where individuals who had opportunity lost the opportunity. He's talking about the children of Israel. They all wandered in the wilderness. They all ate the same spiritual meat. They, they all had manna. They all had quail. They all had this experience, and yet they died and didn't enter into the promised land. And the Bible says they are examples for us. And then the phrase is, they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Who is that? Well, that's us. In other words, it is expected that we are living in the, in the end times. These are the end times. Now, when Jesus comes and takes up His saints, my friend, that's not when the end times begin. That's when the seven years of tribulation began. At the end of seven years, then Christ is going to set up His rule and reign for a thousand years. But we're living in the last days. We're living in the end times. A lot of times, you know, we think that the end times are this generation. Well, actually, end times are the church age. The church age is the end of the age or the end times age. And that's an important truth for us to understand. Here's why. It's important for us to realize that we need to stay in our lane and we need to be who we are supposed to be. One of the most frustrating things to observe as a pastor who is trying to unify a church to do the work of the Great Commission is to realize that believers are so involved in everything except for what they're supposed to be involved in. Some years ago, I, I came to accept the reality that if I were to schedule a prophecy conference, like if we were to every Friday night, like some churches do, or some people do, have like a Bible study and just share what's going on in Israel today. Uh, if we were to just talk about what's going on in Israel today and talk about the end times, that we'd get a real turnout for it. A lot of people would come. Matter of fact, people would rather hear about that than go soul winning. I, I, if we were to have an end times or an Israel day once a week in our church, we'd get way more people to come to that and talk about, speculate about the significance of events in the Middle East today than we would for people to go out soul winning. That's a fact. And it's tragic because this is not the dispensation of Israel. This is the church. These are the end times. This is the last chance. These are the last days. And so many Christians are so caught up with trying to predict future events on the basis of present day events that they've overlooked the day and age in which they live in. And it's important for you and I to realize that we're living in the last days and those days are limited. And we need to be doing what we're supposed to be doing at the time we're supposed to be doing it. Listen, I'm not going to miss anything that happens in the future events with Israel. I'll be there for them. I'm going to be part of those other nations that rule and reign together with Jesus Christ. I'm not going to miss a thing in the future I sure don't want to miss the present because I'm afraid of missing the future. Do you understand the importance of not only eminence, but understanding what it means to be living in the last days? If we're living in the last days, and we are, then it is of vital um, importance that we do the last things Jesus told us to do. Do you remember in Acts chapter 1, the Bible says that after Jesus was 
raised from the dead. He was shown, he showed by many infallible proofs to them. He was seen 40 days. And the Bible says that he was speaking or teaching them of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So he's talking about actually future events, the kingdom. And the Bible says that after that, then one of the disciples asked Jesus the question, and they said, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? In other words, that's what people want to look at future events of, right? Who wants to say, what about Israel? What is the Israel of 1948 and 1967? Is the Israel right now, is, is, is the temple ready to be built? Everybody's, more Christians are more fascinated with what pagans are doing. Now let me just tell you something today. Judaism today is paganism. They are not worshiping God. They have not accepted Jesus as their Messiah. They have substituted paganism. And so many Christians are just fascinated by the Temple Institute, who which is supposedly has created, recreated or remade all of the instruments to go into the temple once it's built. You know how significant that is? That all of the instruments, all the furniture of the temple are already made? Do you know how significant that is? <coughs> God's going to squash it with His thumb and make stuff that's consecrated. Because it's not consecrated to God. That's garbage. <coughs> The Temple Institute is garbage, my friend. And that's not anti-Semitic of me. I am, I am for God's people, Israel. And I don't want to stand with anyone who stands against people that God has just blessed. But let me just tell you something. There's nothing going on on that spot in the Middle East right now. Right now. There's nothing happening there. God isn't doing anything there. Anything that's happening there is being done through the church. Did you hear me? It's not happening through Judaism, which is paganism. It's happening through anything happening there is happening through the church. But Christians are so fascinated with what's happening there that they couldn't care less what God's doing right now. And so Jesus told the disciples, He said, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath placed in His power, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. In other words, he said, it's the last days, guys. That's a future event. Live in the moment. Live in the moment. And a person who does not understand that we are in the last days is a person who doesn't understand how to live in the day. Live in the moment. You'll worry about the past or you'll worry about the future and you will squander both. Because tomorrow, today's, present will be past tomorrow and you'll have spent the present worrying about the future or the past and you'll have lost it it's important for us to live in the moment living in the moment is to realize we're in the last days i don't have time well pastor what do you think about this world leader what do you think about that person well i know that jesus said when you hear of wars and rumors of wars see that you be not troubled for the end is not yet in other words jesus said those things signify nothing Here's what you look for. Look for me to come and to call you up. And when I come, things are going to get serious. Things are going to get moving at that time. We're living in the last days. Hebrews chapter 12 will be the last uh, verse that we look at this evening in the Scripture. Uh, chapter 12. I'm always afraid when I have notes that my notes aren't going to be what they're supposed to be. <coughs> It's not Hebrews chapter 12, it's Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2. God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, notice this, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds. That's verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 1. <coughs> God hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. When are the last days? Church age. Yeah. Present. Present day today is the last days. And that's an important doctrine for believers to understand. And again, it has related significance to the doctrine of eminence. The doctrine of eminence shows us that Jesus is coming soon and we better be ready. Better be doing what we're supposed to be doing when He gets there. When He gets here. 
And the doctrine of the last days, understanding that we're living in the last days, is significant for us to understand that we better be living in the moment instead of the past or instead of the future. So we need to have our focus what it ought to be. All right, well, let's thank God for what we've learned this evening. I hope it's a help to you. Father, thank you for what you've taught us, and I pray that this would be a truth that would transcend uh, in our lives in such a way that we would, in a very, very practical, in a very, very practical way, embrace the hour in which we live and not live for the past, not live for the future, but to live in the present. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Anybody have any questions about what we covered tonight? It's more of a teaching kind of a lesson tonight. Anybody have anything that you had a question about? I got you by surprise by asking for questions. So, okay. All right, if you think of something, text me or email me or let me know, and I'll try to deal with it uh, next Wednesday evening. Okay, let's uh, go ahead and take some prayer requests. Let me just start by...